You know, Jesus said in, uh, in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And then he says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And as we come together and, and, and sing and worship the Lord with the praise songs that we sing, let's come and worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay. So if everyone wants to stand, we're going to start out with kind of an upbeat one. It's Victory Song.
Even those right now that are rejecting God and saying there is no God and saying that Jesus was just some guru, some teacher, one day they're going to kneel and confess that he is Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for being our Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are our leader, that you are our we know the victory. We know that we are going to win, Lord. We know that you're, through your strength, trusting you, <coughs> abiding in your, in your laws and your teachings, Lord, will make us stronger and more courageous for you. I thank you, Lord, that you are with us right this moment with us, Lord. We feel your presence and the spirit within. I pray, Lord, that each person will be touched by your words. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with Pastor Rick as he gives us a message. Fill our lives with, with you, Lord, totally with you, that you are our Lord. And I give this all to you in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There we go. I knew it was there. Well, we're continuing our study in Psalms 119, longest chapter in the Bible. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, drawing comfort in God's covenant. Drawing comfort in God's covenant. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 49 through 56 in Psalms 119. But before we begin this morning, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. <clears throat> Very serious questions, as a matter of fact, that you need to think about. Uh, the first one is this. Do you delight in God's word? Do you delight in God's word? That, that word delight means to take great pleasure in. Do you take great pleasure in opening God's word and reading God's word? And Do you delight in, in what you can learn from God's word, the wisdom that God can give you through his word, the instructions that he gives you, the the encouragement that he gives you, the promises he gives you. Do you delight, really, in God's word? The second question is this. This one is a pretty thought-provoking question when I first, when I first heard it. Uh, I can't remember who, who it was that asked the question, but it's this. Does your love for God lead you to increasing obedience to the Word of God? You think about that. Does your love for God lead you to what? Increasing obedience to the Word of God. Each day we ought to be more and more committed to be in God's Word, to delight in God's Word, and to be obedient to God's word. Now in, in uh, Psalm 119 as we're studying today we're going to look at the seventh paragraph uh, verses 49 through 56. The paragraph is entitled Zayn. Z-A-Y-I-N is the Hebrew word. It's the uh, seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And as you recall last week as we looked at the previous chapter we dealt with the psalmist's prayer as, as he prayed 
that, that he would experience God's mercies and, and salvation according to the promise of his covenant. Remember in, uh, uh, we talked, we, we shared this last week in uh, Genesis seventeen seven. God uh, said, I will establish, and he's talking to Abram, and he says, Abram, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. You know what that everlasting covenant means? It's a covenant that never ends. Never ends. It is everlasting <clears throat> for an everlasting covenant to be your God and your descendants after you. God says, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. What's so good about that? When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you're adopted into the family of God and you become His people. And we have that covenant promise. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And that's an everlasting promise. Now in this paragraph, the psalmist faces some ridicule from some proud, some arrogant people. Uh, If you notice uh, what he says there in verse 51, he says, the proud have made me in great derision. He's facing some ridicule, some persecution from some very proud people, but arrogant people. And, and And how does he deal with it? He deals with it by drawing comfort from God's covenant promise. Don't worry about what people say about you or say to you and everything. Take comfort in the fact that God says, forever and ever, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And I remember when I was a young kid, I was, a, I was the one that got bullied in school a lot. And uh, I would run home to mom or dad because <clears throat> they could protect me. Listen, when we're in a situation, no matter what the situation is, we run home to daddy. We run home to God, our father. He is the one that is strong enough to take care of us, to protect us. When you get that, you know, I used to go home to Mama. I, I, I remember one time I was riding my bike and I got my foot caught in the spokes of my bike. And right between my toes, it just kind of split it open a little bit. And I run home to Mama. And she's saying, what? And I was crying because I was a young kid, you know. And, and she said, what's, what's wrong, son? I said, I got a boo-boo. <laughs> well, how'd you get that? And then she looked down and, oh, my goodness, look at all that blood. She took care of me. She took care of me. Listen, our Heavenly Father is like that with us. When we get a boo-boo in our life, we can run to Him. And He'll take care of us. Because He says, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. He takes care of us. In this particular passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, verses 49 through 56, we're given three ways, three ways in which the psalmist draws comfort from God's covenant uh, promise, from God's uh, covenant that he made with with Abram, which extends to us. The first one is this. The psalmist remembers God's covenant promises. Sometimes we forget. We we get into a situation that is is intense or a situation that's strong and everything, and and we start to we start to panic. Because for, for that moment of time we've we've forgotten. I've got a I've got a God that loves me and cares for me and, and he cares about everything in my life. Not just the big things that happen, but the little things that happen. I can turn to him. 
And, and, and the psalmist remembers God's covenant promises. Look what he says. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort and my affliction. For your word has given me life. He's saying, God, I, I remember your word. I remember your word, Lord, which, and, and, and it's caused me to have hope. When you read the word of God, does it cause you to have hope? Sometimes when we're down and, and out, and we, we, we go to the word of God when, when we're being attacked. No matter who it is that's doing the attacking, whether it's family, whether it's, it's uh uh, people, someone in the world, non-Christians, ungodly people or anything, I can go to the Word of God and get hope because my hope is built on nothing less. Right? Listen. Remember the Word to your servant. I remember the Word that you gave me, Lord, upon which you have caused me to hope. Verse 49. The psalmist is, is, is bringing to mind God's promises and, and, and he's letting God know that I remember that promise. I remember those words. I remember what you said. He's most likely referring to uh, God's covenant promises that, that he made in, <clears throat> in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28 verses 1 through 13. We're just going to look at the first two verses of uh, of Deuteronomy 28. Now it shall come to pass. Listen. If. Boy whenever you. When, whenever God's speaking. Or the Lord's speaking. And he says. Now this is going to happen. If. Well you better pay close attention to what that if is. Remember as I said before. For every promise. There's a premise. No matter where you go in the Word of God, every promise has a premise. And this is a premise. Now it shall come to pass. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all His commandments. You notice what He says? Not just part of them. He wants you to observe all of His commandments. You take the word of God in its entirety. All. Which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above nations on earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And then he goes on through there, through, through this uh, next uh, 11 verses and just lists one after another promises, things that's going to happen, blessings, blessings that are, is going to come upon them because they're obedient to the Word of God. I like, uh, <clears throat> I really like what the first part of, of uh, the book of Psalms, how it starts out, right? I mean, right from the gate. Right from the gate, it starts out, blessed is the man. And then it says, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the word of God. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And God is saying, I want you to obey my word be in my word. Take delight in my word and be obedient to my word day and night. Now understand this. Listen. God does not need to be reminded of his promises. You don't have to say, now God, let me remind you what you said way back here. Or let me remind you what you wrote in your, in your word way back here. Listen, God never forgets. Never forgets. So don't you ever forget that God never forgets. 
because he never does. The psalmist is praying for, for the fulfillment of God's promises because it is upon those promises that he has based all of his hope. Listen, very important that we get this, this principle. It's very important. Listen, our hope is not based on the assurances of man. Because they'll eventually disappoint us. Our hope is in the sovereign and faithful God. Because he is able and he is willing to fulfill all that he has promised. Did y'all catch that? You, you get, let, me, let me say it again. You know, sometimes repetition is good. Get it the second time. Listen, our hope is not based on the assurances of man. For they will eventually disappoint us. Our hope is in the sovereign and faithful God because he is able and willing to fulfill all that he has promised. There's a stanza of a very popular song that, uh, that I like. It goes like this. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around me my soul gives way, he, he then is all my hope and stay on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Where do you stand in your life this morning? Are you standing on the solid rock? Or are you standing on sinking sand? If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life as your personal Savior, you're on sinking sand, my friend. And, and when, when, the, when the, the tide comes in, you're going to get washed out. You're going to sink. When the storms come, you're going to fall. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And, and, and let me tell you something. When he says that he is my hope and my stay on Christ, the solid rock I stand, that's biblical hope. That is biblical hope, not wishful hope. It is an assured hope in which we can put our faith. Ivan Riskino states it like this. It is solid ground on which to base an expectation that deep down in our hearts we are sure will be fulfilled. Then he goes on in verse 50. He said, This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. The psalmist was having to contend with the ridicule, the persecution of prideful, arrogant men. And after putting up with this persecution for so long, it tends to get oppressive. And in the face of this continued oppression, he's nourished. He is sustained by the promise of God. God's word. So that so he, he develops this uh, the sense of well-being as an overcomer. He feels like I'm an overcomer. I've got the promises of God. I've got the Word of God. Listen, we overcome our enemies by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. By the blood of Jesus Christ and by the power of the word of God. Revelations 12, 11 tells us. They overcame them by what? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. By the word of God. Our testimony is in God's word. It is God's word. So the first thing is that the psalmist remembers God's covenant promises Secondly, the psalmist remembers how historically God ruled in the affairs of his people. 
verses 51 through 53. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remember your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. See in verse 51 what he says? The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. The, the, the psalmist is, is continuously facing persecution from, from proud and godless people. A lot of believers find this difficult to handle, although we're certainly warned in God's word that we will be ridiculed in this world. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live in Christ, uh, to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. When Jesus walked this earth, he was reviled, he was ridiculed. He was despised. He was insulted. Yet he, he set an example. He set an example for us to follow. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.23 that Jesus, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. When we're faced with ridicule and persecution because of our faith, we must be committed to following the teachings of God's word and to follow the example that Jesus gave us. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the last part of, uh, or in chapter 4, that is, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the last part of verse 12 and also verse 14, he says this, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being Defamed, we entreat. We have been made the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. Being, listen, being reviled, we bless. I, I like uh, really the way God's Word translation puts this. And the God's Word translation says, when people persecute us, we endure it. When our reputations are attacked, we remain courteous. Right now, we have become garbage in the eyes of the world and trash in the sight of the people. How does the world look on Christians today? Doesn't this follow what Paul was telling us? And Paul's saying, okay, how should we respond? When, when someone attacks us personally, when people persecute us, we endure it. You know why? Because we can handle it. Because we have a God who has big shoulders that can handle anything that we, that we bring to him. It says we are garbage in the eyes of the world and trash in the sight of all people. That's so true in our world today. Christians around the world are being persecuted. They're being attacked, beaten, killed. Our reputations are being attacked. And many are looked upon as garbage in the sight or in the eyes of this ungodly world. And it's not getting easier for Christians. And it will not get any easier because we're living in tough times. Times that God told us was going to happen. Jesus told us 
he, he, he told us specifically, things are going to get tough. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be reviled. You're going to suffer. You're, you're going to be killed. When people persecute us, we endure it. When they attack us, remain courteous. Verse 52. I remember your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. The word judgments there, it's from the Hebrew word meaning misfat, or the word misfat. It means the, the righteous ways in which God rules and judges in human affairs. See, what the psalmist is doing here is he is recalling from God's word the righteous way in which God has ruled on behalf of his people, bringing comfort in this present situation. When he feels oppressed by this continuous ridicule of, of ungodly people. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. We get our hope in the Word of God. The psalmist said in in, uh, in verse 114 of this particular chapter we're looking at, uh, 119, chapter 119, verse 114, he says this, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Then he goes on in verse 53 to say, Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Those those pride, prideful, arrogant, ungodly people who mocked the psalmist. Listen, they were his enemies. Listen, if a person is an enemy of God, they're your enemy also. Because you can only be in one of two camps. You can either be in Satan's camp or God's camp. You can either, either be living a life committed to the Lord Jesus Christ or, or you're living in the world. And that's a life committed to Satan. Because if you're living in the world, you're living in rebellion to God. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. When we are living and walking in rebellion to God, we're actually inviting those demons into our lives. People wonder why they have so much problem in their life. I've had people come and sit in my office and says, I don't understand this. I'm getting attacked constantly, all the time. And, and, and I'm feeling this demonic oppression. And, and my, my question to them is, are you living in rebellion to the Word of God or are you living in agreement to God's Word? Are you subjecting yourself to the, to the Word of God? Not just parts of it because sometimes we like to pick and choose what we want to obey and disobey it's just like the laws that we have in our country you know we pick and choose which laws we'll obey and which laws we'll try to get away with indignation has taken Hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Those prideful, those arrogant, ungodly people who, who mocked the psalmists were his enemies. Now, when, when thinking about them, then he displayed some passionate anger, indignation. He was outraged. Not because they ridiculed or persecuted him or because they were his enemies, but because they had turned against God's laws. 
They were rejecting God. Charles Spurgeon said of the psalmist, he is astonished at their wickedness, stunned by their presumption, and amazed by the terror of their certain doom. But we, we must consider these feelings of the psalmist alongside with other feelings that he had for those who had forsaken God's word. For instance, in, in uh, verse 136 of 119, he says, Rivers of waters run down my eyes because men do not keep your law. He wept. Why? Because it broke his heart to see people rejecting God's word and doomed for eternity in hell. Do you weep for the lost? How about those in your family that are lost without Christ? Do you weep over them? In Psalm 119, verse 158, he says, I see the treacherous and am disgusted because they do not keep your word. He says, I see the treacherous, those those." faithless, ungodly people, and am disgusted. That is, I have a feeling of intense dislike, loathing, or hatred. Because they do not keep, they do not obey your word. So we see, not only is he heartbroken, but he's also angry at the same time by the attitude of these ungodly men towards God's word. Listen, how do you feel about the attitude of those in our world who flaunt their sinful lifestyles? Who frequently and flagrantly violate God's word and have no remorse whatsoever? How do you feel about that? Mixed emotions? Yeah, I I weep because... I know that without Christ, I know what their destiny is. But I'm also angry inside because they're violating God's word. They're they're violating God's reputation, God's honor. So the psalmist draws comfort from God's covenant by remembering God's covenant promises and by remembering how historically God ruled in the affairs of these people. Thirdly, the psalmist takes refuge in God's covenant. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law This has become mine because I kept your precepts. In in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, Peter tells us that when, when, when people hurled their insults at Jesus, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he didn't make any threats. Instead, Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, to God the Father. The psalmist did something very similar. He didn't retaliate, even though he was outraged and he grieved at the way the ungodly paid no attention to God's laws. But instead of retaliating and, and, and hurling insults and threats back at his oppressors, he took refuge in God's covenant in every situation, wherever he was. What is it to take refuge in God's covenant? To take refuge in God's covenants, in God's covenant, the, pil- the, 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 the psalmist did three things. The first thing he did was he worships God and entrusts himself to God. 
That's the first thing. That's the first place we ought to go. We ought to go to the cross. We ought to, we ought to worship our God. And we ought to entrust ourselves to him. We ought to come to him and totally surrender ourselves to him. Verse 54 says, your, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I worship you, God. I entrust myself to you. Second thing is that he doesn't allow anxiety to overtake him. He remembers that God has made an everlasting covenant with his people Israel. Isn't it? It's so easy now for for people to become anxious or fearful with all that's going on around us in the world today. I see a lot of anxiety right now in the situation in our country, not only with the COVID-19, not only with the wildfires in our areas, but with our government. And uh, it's easy to get anxious and upset over that. But the psalmist doesn't let that overtake him. He goes back and he remembers that God has made an everlasting covenant. Doesn't matter what the world thinks. Doesn't matter what the world does. I'm here. I'm your God. And someday you're going to be home with me and you're going to spend eternity with me. Someday, I am going to righteously and rightfully and justly judge those who are in opposition to me. Those who are persecuting you. Those who are mistreating you. I guess in, in sort of the modern day terms, he says they're going to get their upcomings. And that's a sad thing though. It's a sad thing. You know, we shouldn't be excited or happy about, well, you're going to get yours. We ought to be sad because, because you're going to get yours. Because of where they're going to spend eternity. Look what he says in verse 55. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your laws. I remember your covenant. And then the third thing is this. He is, faith, he, he is faithful himself and keeps the covenant with Yahweh by constant obedience to God's word. By constant obedience to God's word. He, he develops this lifestyle of obedience to the word of God. He, he delights in the Word of God and, and develops this lifestyle obedience in God's Word. That's what, we, that's what our goal is. That's, that's what our, our, uh, our, our, our goal is. We're going through Psalms 119 is to delight in the Word of God and to develop this lifestyle obedience in our lives. He says in verse 56, this has become mine because I kept your precepts. This is my life. I'm going to live in obedience to your word. I'm going to, I've kept them and I'm going to keep on keeping them. In this paragraph of Psalm 119, we see the, the psalmist as he draws comfort from God's covenant. What do you draw comfort from in your, in your life? God has made an everlasting covenant with us as well. You know, the Bible says in John chapter Chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children 
of God to those who believe in his name. Remember what I said about effective evangelism? It's simply presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God? Because see, Jesus did his part on the cross. Remember I said that? He, he died for our sins. That we might be uh, two things, two results from his death on the cross. Number one, we were freed from the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ died so that we wouldn't have to spiritually die. So he freed us from the penalty of sin. But secondly, he freed us from the power of sin. Because we're now no longer, we're, we're, we're no longer slaves to sin. We have a freedom to choose not to sin. Because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross. And, and, and as we accept God's invitation to become his children, the kingdom gospel is simply this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But as many as received him, as received Jesus Christ as their Savior, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus did his part. The Holy Spirit will do his part by drawing people to God. And, and listen, God will do his part by adopting them into his family. That they might become his children children of God it says to those who believe on his name the Bible teaches that if we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you shall be saved we become recipients of God's covenant promises to Israel he will be our God and we will be his people it is because of the cross of Jesus Christ that we can come to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and become children of God and inherit eternal life. But understand this. That life cannot be obtained without the cross of Christ. You can't get to God through any other way. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. My challenge to you this morning is this. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that today. Just simply say, God, I believe Jesus Christ is your son, that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need your forgiveness for my sins. And now I ask you to forgive me, God, and come into my life and be my God. Let me be your child. Secondly, I invite you to recommit your life to Christ. Maybe, maybe you've kind of gotten sideways a little bit. You've kind of taken a detour. You need to get back on track. I invite you to recommit your life to Christ. Let Him be Lord of your life. Thirdly, I invite you to daily worship God and as the psalmist did, entrust yourself to Him. To make that commitment that every day, I won't let the day go by without being in His Word. Whether I read just one verse or five verses or ten verses or a chapter or, or, or two chapters, whatever. I'm going to be in God's Word every single day. 
Now you might say, well, pastor, I, I, I just don't have time in the morning to do that. That's okay. Don't do it in the morning time. Do it during the daytime. Do it, do it at nighttime before you go to bed. Boy, that's a good time to read God's word because then it's on your mind throughout the night. But be in the word every day. Every day. You might say, well, pastor, I can't carry my Bible with me. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. These things are marvelous. I got an app on here. So it's called the Word of Promise app. And man, I can just go in there and, and I click onto a, a passage of Scripture. And then I reach down in the bottom and I click on that little, that little triangle. And it speaks to me. <laughs> and I hear... I hear this voice saying, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. So you can can be driving down the highway on a trip or something, driving down the highway. I got mine where I get in my car, the thing, my, my, my phone automatically hooks up to my radio and comes through my speakers. Sometimes that's scary, you know, all of a sudden I get this, I forget I had my phone t- turned up real loud and, 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 and my volume turned up loud and this thing all of a sudden starts blaring at me. Gets my attention, but I can listen to the Word of God while I'm driving down the road. You, you, we have no, today's world, we have no excuse whatsoever for not being in the Word of God every day. None. I also want to invite you and challenge you this morning to not allow anxiety or fear to overtake you, but to remember God's promises. Don't let this COVID-19 scare you. God's in control, not us. Remember what what the Word says in in, uh, Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Man, when something's happening in my life, I'm going to run to God. You know, when... I, the other day, the other night, I, I got to tell you, the other night I, I got ready. I was here pretty late at night. I guess it was after dark, and I stepped outside, and and I got ready to, to lock the door, and I heard this, ooh, ooh, ooh. There's an owl up there. But then I also heard another sound, and it scared me. I ran back inside. <laughs> I'm going to run away from danger. I thought it was a cougar out there or something. So I had one flashlight that I had in my car, and I ran out to the car, got my flashlight, and came back inside again. And then I went to my desk in my office and grabbed the other flashlight. I got two very powerful flashlights. I turned them both on at the same time and was aiming. Man, it, was, it just lit up the whole thing. But what, what did I do? I ran away from the danger. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it. We run away from the danger. We run to God. We turn to God. No, no, I turn to God. God is the light of the world. (laughs) No, I I wanted to see what was out there. I never did see what it was, but it was a really strange. You know, I'm I'm thinking, I wonder, man... (laughs) Did my neighbor come over here and he, is he trying to play games with me or something, you know? Because uh, my good friend Chris Chamberlain does that once in a while to me, you know? So he, when he used to live across the street, he would sit over there and he would golf. He'd hit golf balls over the highway into, into our property over here. I picked up one of them, took them out to I found one of your golf balls in my yard, huh? He said, yeah. He said, I'm going to wait till Sunday morning now when you're having services and everything, and then I'm going to really hit one over and let it hit the building or something, see what your people do. <laughs> oh, I love him. 
So I want to invite you not to be anxious, not to be overtaken by the things that's going on in our world today around us, the politics and stuff like that. God's in control. And then I want to invite you to be faithful to the Lord and His Word. Be faithful to the Lord and His Word. To live a lifestyle of obedience to the Word of God. Because this, this is the truth of the matter. The whole thing is this. Jesus Christ is our help for today. He's our hope for tomorrow. That's where our hope is to be placed in. In Jesus Christ. Not in the world. Our help for today. Our hope for tomorrow. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the words of the psalmist and for what he teaches us. And, and Father, for the encouragement that we get, <clears throat> that even in the midst of, of, of persecution, in the midst of, of opposition, in the midst of and, and living in this ungodly world, dark world, with all that's going on around us, Father, we place our hope in you because you are our hope for today. Our help for today, our hope for tomorrow. And we thank you. Thank you for your covenant promise. Thank you for your words that we shared this morning from the psalmist and the encouragement that we can get out of it. And, and so, Lord, I'm, I'm asking this morning that as we have, as we have studied these words, as we have... Uh, observed what the psalmist had to say that we will that we will have the knowledge and the understanding of what was spoken this morning and that God you would give us wisdom wisdom to apply what we've learned this morning to our lives we pray in Jesus name amen <clears throat>